Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion On Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenhill and I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So on today's show, we are going to talk about intergroup communication. This is such a cool topic. It follows really, really nicely with some of the previous episodes that I've done this summer about talking um, across issues around race and gender and sexual orientation and all kinds of stuff. Um, we are currently, of course, in a moment that is like three months long because <laughs> apparently in 2020 moments last a very, very long time, but we are in a moment um, where folks have heightened uh, senses of awareness about systemic discrimination and racism, and we're all eager to explore ways of learning uh, more, asking more, um, and just being more engaged around really challenging topics and things. And so, um, not the least of which, of course, is we also have an election, right? So there's just, there's a pandemic, there's social unrest, there's an election. 2020 is everything and nothing all at once because we can't go anywhere. Anyway, uh, I'm really excited about this topic. I am so delighted to welcome my guest, Dr. Teresa Graham Brett from the University of Arizona's College of Veterinary Medicine. Teresa is the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the college. And of course, for folks that don't know, University of Arizona is one of our newest schools and we are really just um, so excited to hear and see what's going on uh, new there. So Teresa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenhill. Can I call you Lisa? Please call me Lisa. This is that laid back podcast show where we don't, we, we do that, we do that doctor stuff up front and then we get rid of it and get into right. the gritty. So, <laughs> So as is our custom, Teresa, we have our guests introduce themselves and tell a little bit about um, themselves and their background. So sure. where are you, where are you from? Um, I, I'm not gonna start the year I was born because that'll be too long <laughs> of a story. But uh, <laughs> I actually was born in Tucson, um, Arizona. And, uh, and I went to the University of Arizona. Here I got my degrees, I got a law degree, and then I went into higher education because I felt like it was a better match for what I wanted to accomplish in my life. And the reality of practicing law hit me in my first semester in law school. But I finished my law degree and decided to go into higher education. And uh, I worked primarily in uh, retention programs, summer, summer bridge programs that worked with students of color and low income students and first generation college students. Had the opportunity to move on to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And there I uh, worked with the program on intergroup relations. So I had the opportunity to serve as the co-director there for six years. Uh, and got to really understand intergroup dialogue, which is the foundation of what I'm going to talk about today, and really found a passion for the work around of working across groups um, to foster greater skill in understanding a whole number of things that we're going to talk about today. Um, and then after I, um, I was also associate dean there and uh, moved on to the University of Texas at Austin, started an intergroup dialogue program there where I was associate VP and dean of students. And uh, then we had the chance to partner with the University of Michigan and eight other institutions in a three-year longitudinal research project on the outcomes of an, the intergroup dialogue curriculum. And we got to see that um, all of the things that the program had developed, all the faculty, all the staff who worked on the program and developing this curriculum, what we knew in practice um, bore itself out in this um, 10, nine university, ultimately nine universities, wow. we started with 10 universities, nine universities, where we instituted a common curriculum across all of those universities. And um, we were able to look at the outcomes, small, private, large, public, East Coast, uh, Midwest, um, South, West, South, uh, wow. Southwest, um, West Coast, all over. And um, it was an amazing project to be a part of. We were an implementation site and we saw what the outcomes were. Um, so it reinforced 
reinforced my passion for intergroup communication, intergroup dialogue in particular, as a, a kind of um, communication that has a critical structure and um, process. And then I quit higher ed and I consulted because <laughs> I was like, I'm done. I got to get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I worked a lot with many universities across the country to help them start intergroup dialogue programs. And then I got sucked back in, in Arizona, because that's home, moved back home, and um, rejoined the University of Arizona and would have never expected five years later that I'm at the College of Veterinary Medicine, which is a fantastic opportunity because we're building from the ground up and the commitment yeah. from our college is to integrate fully into the curriculum um, diversity and inclusion. So exciting. So exciting. So why don't we just dive right on in for folks that are watching live. The chat is open. So Teresa, you still there? I am. Are you there? All right. Yes. Okay. We were freezing up. We were. We had a moment of freezing there. So. Wait, you froze too. So I was like, <laughs> me or you? Who knows? <laughs> it's live, folks. So, what exactly is intergroup communication? Yeah. Well, I. Um. You know, the the. I'm going to talk in particular the form that we um, instituted through the intergroup dialogue program and as part of that curriculum and what we studied. Um, but in essence, it's looking at how we work and communicate across groups, in particular, um, in the ways that we studied it, um, social groups, social identity groups. So embedded in that kind of communication is an understanding of self. So who am I? Um, not just learning about another group that's different from me, but who am I through my own identities, my own experiences, what does that mean for me? And then how does that impact my communication and um, working with um, other groups that are different from me, where we have differential um, connections to systems of power and inequity. And so it's really grounded in understanding who we are and our different connections to our systems and structures and how who we are influences how we see the world and that part of the challenge we have in talking across differences where it's not polarized but where we can create greater understanding and greater equity it requires us to both do our own work our self-work understand who we are in relationship to in in our society and in our cultures as well as then taking on the perspective of the other group. And so in particular, it's meant to really focus on um, understanding what our assumptions are. So what mm. assumptions do I make about how the world is experienced, not only for myself, but other people? And how is it that we come to see the world in such different ways based on how we're treated in our societies and cultures? And so the whole idea is that we contextualize our individual experiences within the broader um, society and structure. And explicitly, we look at power because power is embedded in all of our systems. So whether it's in my role as an associate dean versus a student or a faculty member, whether it's around my identities, um, whether it's around my age, whatever it may be, my race, my gender, that power is embedded in all of our structures. And if we don't acknowledge power in our communication and in our working across groups, then in essence, we're ignoring what is actually hap happening below the surface. And, um, and then we often then ignore or um, gloss over what is different about who we are, but also how we create common ground. And so it looks at both difference and similarity and, similarity. and common ground so that we all have the chance to enter into the communication and the dialogue in such a way that we are more aware of who we are. We hear from others about their experiences and then we're able to say, well, what does that mean in this relationship, in this kind of communication so that we move forward um, to create greater equity, to be more inclusive, to ensure that the wide variety of difference, and I use difference intentionally, sure. Um, is ex is ex explored within the context of systems and structures. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so this brings up so much, right? Especially in a summer where we've had so much social unrest, where so many of the conversations, um, you know, are kind of happening on parallel tracks, but not 
intersecting, right? Yeah. yeah. And and you know, to 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 I mean, I hate to kind of rehash, um, you know, the 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 what I consider the murder of George Floyd, but the shocking, you know, how how so many people reacted to seeing the video. It seems like there was there was definitely a lot of communication happening, right? Yeah. <laughs> In viewing the video, but also the lenses that we saw the video through, right? And so for some of us who see videos all the time of this kind of situation, it was, here is another example of X, right? Yeah. And for a lot of people, just not just in the US, but globally, they were like, oh my God, oh my, oh my goodness, this is a thing, like, right. this is right. horrible. And, 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 you know, and it was like, why didn't I know this before? And I'm like, I don't know, the other 87,000 <laughs> videos, apparently didn't resonate, right? For whatever reason, but it gets to that um, kind of the conflict um, and that difference of the way that we see the world and how we understand yeah. um, how we move through it. Mm -hmm. So so just, uh, yeah, so it's just bringing up a lot. So I can't wait to ask all kinds of questions. So many folks now will think that we're talking about intercultural communication, but this yeah. is different. So how is this different? Yeah, it, you know, it's really interesting when I, I uh, my previous role here at U University of Arizona was working in the central equity and inclusion efforts. And so I had, um, you know, I, I was collaborating with our um, Center for the English as a Second Language and they had mm -hmm. developed an intercultural course. Um, and we spent some time, and I also um, supervised um, the leadership of the International Center at the University of Michigan. And mm -hmm. the director there was very much into intercultural communication, which I think is a critical component of understanding our different cultural experiences, and in particular, looks at domestic, international, um, cross-cultural kinds of experiences. Um, and as uh, my colleagues who were teaching the intercultural communication class and I were talking about the entry points for the work that we were doing around intercultural communication, intergroup dialogue, or intergroup communication, what we became clear was that the um, intercultural communication, which is what they named, the faculty named, we don't necessarily come directly out and name structures and systems and what our different relationships are to those structures and systems based on our identities and our experiences or our cultures. And so I think intercultural communication is a really important and powerful tool, but I think in, in the moment, in our own, you know, the moments of our entire history <laughs> in the United States, right. um, and understanding those power structures are always part of that intergroup communication. And, and that even if you don't see it, because it is not your experience, which is the reality for many people. It is even, it's the reality for me around my own identities where I am um, in the privileged group, the centered group. So even my own struggle to see my privilege and what I do and the ways in which I have power that's just given to me mm -hmm. is difficult to see because those structures are meant for us to not see them when I have the privilege. So inherent in intergroup dialogue or intergroup communication is really naming that piece. So not only, for example, do I not see my cisgender privilege on a daily basis, um, the world is set up for me. I never have to think about it. I never have to consider traveling and what my passport says and what's gonna happen when I go through the x-ray, whatever machine, right? So I am built in this, this culture is, and society is built for me. And so I have a lot of compassion when I can look at all of my various identities because all of them have different connections to power structures. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see those sometimes. And then I do harm unintentionally to others as a result of that. So I try to also bring that back to when I'm working around identities where I'm marginalized and harmed, I get angry, I get upset. And then I think, okay, and you didn't see how you harmed somebody last week. 
And so the complexity of who we are in these, in our societies and in our structures is always there. Um, and the intersections of oppression are complex and we don't always see those except where the intersections marginalize us. Mm -hmm. So part of what I see as the goal of intergroup communication in contrast to intercultural communication, which is um, a whole other field that has value and importance is that given our particular history and structures and systems and what we're trying to do in veterinary medical education, in all of higher education, sure. um, those kinds of analysis are really important to being able to shift toward greater inclusion and equity. Mm, great, great. So you mentioned earlier um, intergroup dialogues, which, yeah. which, which you suggested is kind of a maybe a type of intergroup communication. So are there other kinds of intergroup communication? Can you explain a bit about kind of what, what these little components look like? <laughs> yeah, well, there is a whole field in psychology of intergroup relations. Okay. And so much of what the um, intergroup dialogue model or curriculum or pedagogy or whatever process that you want um, uh, is built upon understanding the dynamics of intergroup relations. Um, and so the foundation of intergroup dialogue is a greater understanding of intergroup um, relations, meaning like contact theory. The more contact you have with a group that's mm -hmm. different from you, the more that you see within that group, for example, difference. Because mm -hmm. often when a group that is different from me, I am not close to, I don't look closely, all I see is a monolithic group. It's sort of like the model minority myth that you, sure, sure. you know, all of that, like, oh, this group is all like this. But the closer contact I have, the more opportunity I have, then the more that I can see the, that one, a group is not monolithic. Yeah, the diversity contains. within the group. Yes, and so that's critical across all groups. Mm, yeah. And so embedded in that isn't necessarily power. Um, you know, so the, the intergroup dialogue brings together um, intergroup relations, um, studies and theories and contact theory. It brings together communication skills. It also brings in fundamentally conflict skills because conflict is embedded in intergroup relations when you're yeah, willing yeah. to address power structures. Um, and just because we have different perspectives. <laughs> mm, yeah. We could yeah. differ about, you know, any number of issues, Lisa, and be talking about that in <laughs> conflict. Um, so, you know, so intergroup um, dialogue in that way brings together a number of pieces that build upon some social justice education, though it's not just social justice education. It's built upon Paulo Freire's work, um, who wrote Pedagogy mm -hmm. of the Oppressed, in terms of a liberatory educational process that is co-created among participants in the group together. So the goal isn't for me to come in and tell you, this is what you should think about this, but this is what I think about it. Why do I think that? And then you, Lisa, tell me, well, this is how I think about it and why, what contributes to the way I see the world versus the way you see the world? And then how does that tie to broader systems and structures? So what does that mean for us to then work together um, to acknowledge and understand that and move forward together? So I don't know if I answered your question, wow. Lisa, but it was a long answer. And yeah, it was good. <laughs> yeah, so, so help me understand kind of what some of those principles are. Like, what are the rules of engagement, if you will, <laughs> um, <laughs> for, for, you know, engaging yeah. in intergroup communication? Yeah, well, I, that's a great, great question. And, and when we're in, this is actually an activity that we did with students during orientation here at our college. So we used a number of the activities and interactions that we do in intergroup dialogue processes with our students through orientation in small groups, because mm -hmm. our goal was to build the connection between the students in such a way that as we then advance through our professional skills and our clinical skills and our team-based learning, that then they are connecting in ways that allow them to surface conflict and manage that conflict with support as needed. But sure. fundamentally in dialogue or intergroup dialogue in particular, the principles that we're really looking at 
are that we are looking toward what it means to collaborate mm -hmm. and to build a sense of understanding and community understanding. And it also asks us to reevaluate our assumptions and biases. Acknowledge, I should say, acknowledge and reevaluate our assumptions and biases. And that happens through the process together. Um, I think the other area is that we're really looking to bring out ambivalence and complexity, like not an either or, but because the world isn't that way. <laughs> it is far yeah, more complex. Right then we want to put out in sound bites in polarized debate, right? Um, we also try to find shared meaning. So what does it mean that you experience the world this way and I experience the world this way? And how do we make meaning out of that together? Um, collective meaning, discovering that, maybe destabilizing our ideas of the world and other people. So it's all about sort of shaking up the ground <laughs> that you stand firmly on to have you reevaluate those assumptions. We also try to pay attention when we're judging because we all judge, you know, often we'll say, listen, without judgment. Well, heck no, we're all judging all the time. All but, the time. The goal, right? <laughs> but the goal is, can I know that I'm judging? and try to engage in a way that I understand more deeply what that other person is saying. And I understand even my own experience um, more deeply. We also wanna articulate areas of conflict and difference. The goal isn't, isn't it all great? The goal is deep down, the divisions that we experience are significant. And until we raise that forward and are willing to engage in the whys and the what's and the making the meaning of it, we're not gonna move through conflict constructively. And it's not to resolve conflict, it's to work in the conflict that we all experience from our different positions and views of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, and it builds relationships. So I see conflict as generative and not destructive. It, it doesn't mean in moments yeah. that conflict isn't going to be destructive, but there's yeah. also ways to recover from that, to, to yeah. move through that destructive conflict toward creating something more yeah. together. Um, and, and this is going to sound maybe strange, but silence in dialogue is important because it's not always about filling the space all the time, but maybe we're uncomfortable, maybe we're reevaluating, maybe we're far out on that learning edge and we might be going into a panic zone. <laughs> you know, maybe <laughs> there's so much going on, but that silence actually creates space for us to think and feel differently. Yeah, so um, tons of follow-up questions, but uh, I do wanna comment on the, the value of silence um you know i it, it's taken me a long time in my career to really truly appreciate silence and just how especially in the us we are so um there's such a culture of filling space like we just are so uncomfortable with like silence mm -hmm. if you tell someone that you just stayed at home and was quiet all weekend and read a book they're like oh that's that's nice uh, right, right. But but this idea of, I mean, for me, you know, I hear kind of crazy, wild and crazy things all the time related to diversity. And I've just gotten to this place personally where I let it sit. Typically, the person who said whatever they said has that moment to reevaluate, like nobody's saying anything. Maybe I need to do a gut check. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. And so it is about kind of creating that space. But I'm really curious, Teresa, like, so, you know, destabilizing kind of what you think your assumptions and your biases and like, I believe this. And then you kind of get this shaky, shaky earthquake kind of situation. Um, so how do people initially respond to that? <laughs> that part of the exercise. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, it's interesting. One of the things that we're doing in particular in our um, professional skills 
is that, um, and I'm co-teaching with Dr. Ryan Angler and her field of expertise is communication. So we've been able to blend my intergroup mm. dialogue pieces into um, communication um, in vet med and really bring that together in ways. And so one of the things, and it fits really well with clinical skills because a lot of what we're focused on with students is to notice their assumptions. Yeah, yeah. And when you can notice your assumptions, then you can begin to track even below those assumptions are ways that you are trained to see the world. Mm -hmm. So you make those assumptions because you've been trained to make the connections really quickly, um, you know, with repeated experiences over sure. and over. So a critical skill for our students is to notice when you've jumped to an assumption, but you need to actually ask more questions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our students who have less experience bring so many more questions um, than those who might have more experience who might automatically say, oh, this is this thing. And so what we've been doing is really trying to have students and ourselves, because we are trying to engage in this ourselves, um, really pay attention to what's going on. Wow. What's the assumption I'm making? So when we've set up our, we're getting ready next week to do standardized client encounters with our first year students. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, hopefully they're not listening because then they'll know what the assignment's about. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it's all in their pre-work and all of that. But the goal of that is to have them do um, pre-work where they look at a door chart and they read a little bit about the client and the patient. And then at the end, they're gonna do a reflection. And we're gonna mm -hmm. ask them to reflect on assumptions that they made on all different levels, not only about the patient, but the client, and then whether those assumptions were true. Because yeah. if we can begin to do that, then uh, we really are able to track when we're making those automatic, quick decisions that really implicit, implicit bias or any kind of cognitive bias yeah. is based in those automatic connections that are made below the service that we are unaware of. So our goal is to destabilize in lots of ways and to build this critical inquiry skill um, for students at a number of levels. That's that's great. I think that um, the the you know initially I I, I uh, was thinking. I mean, my experience in vet med, lovely lovely folks. I love you all. I do. Um, but a pretty conflict avoidant mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> group. Um, you know, there's there's. I mean, we all have enough conflict in our lives, right? We're not we're not always looking for more. Um, you know, unless it <laughs> serves a purpose, but. But this idea of the destabilizing and kind of being confronted with new information mm -hmm. that you know you didn't you didn't want <laughs> you didn't think you needed, um, but totally changes the game, right? Yeah. Just totally yeah. changes the game is is kind of where it's at. So um, so could you tell us a little bit about maybe one of the exercises that you did during orientation so folks kind of get a a sense yeah. of kind of what that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we did, so the intergroup dialogue model is actually built on four stages. Okay. And the first stage is really just setting the groundwork for engagement. So what does that mean? We did sessions where, so students are um, put together in uh, professional learning communities with faculty and staff who are leading those. And we did a training um, so that they would then be able to facilitate some of the um, reflective activities that we engaged or community building activities. So it actually served multiple purpose. One, so one example is that we, um, we asked the students to reflect on their hopes and fears coming in. And the goal of that activity in particular, and, and the faculty and staff do it as well. So everyone, they did, we did it in training together as a group um, before they were with the students. But the explicit goal of, of um, having people reflect on hopes and fears is to both acknowledge that we share many commonalities and there are distinct differences in what our concerns are. And that, that our goal was to also get a pulse on what are students coming in with and to also humanize our faculty and staff 
yeah, we got hopes and fears too. <laughs> so if we right. think about those power structures, the goal is to create community within that group by mm. acknowledging both the differences and the similarities um, within the group to create um, a human experience. Not like, let's prep you to jump into our foundations course. You know? <laughs> right, Here's right. the content you need to know, but how do you engage together? And because we have a flipped classroom design, that student engagement, how students engage with each other is actually a critical component of the learning process here. Mm -hmm. so, so that was one that we did. We also asked students in the summer and reinforced it during orientation to bring something that was important to them, an item. Teresa? I think you may have frozen. Are you there? There you oh, are. I'm back. Okay, there you're back. back. All right, so they were bringing an item. Yes. So, and I'm sorry, it's giving me my internet connection is unstable, <laughs> which is the most dreaded thing you can get when you're teaching on Zoom or live. Um, so we asked them to bring something that was important to them that represented their journey to vet med where they came from, their community, their family, whatever was important for them. And, and we just, they just shared. They just spent time sharing that. And so that particular activity, you could think of it as an identity object or a cultural object or whatever it might be. What that activity in particular does is one, it breaks down the initial assumptions people make. So let me tell you a little bit more about my journey. And mm. it's vulnerable yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, and people choose the level that they wanted to share. There was no expectation, but what it does is it connects these students together with the faculty and staff into a community that builds a commitment to their relationships with each other so that when conflict arises, then they're committed to working through it. Yeah. And we group them according to their team-based learning groups and two team-based learning groups together because they will stay together over time in our curriculum. Okay. So those are some of the things we also talked about. What's the difference between dialogue, debate, and discussion? Because we really see a lot of debate happening. <laughs> right, right, right. Anytime you turn on the news, uh, we're used to discussion, which is a mode that's used in um, higher ed all the time. Mm -hmm. But we don't often think about what's dialogue. What does it mean? And so the rules of engagement that you asked me about, we actually talked about that with students and the role that that could play. Because it also gives our college a common language to connect to. Um, and, and then we did some things around um, uh, some of our communication, setting students up for both our communications class, our professional skills class, and other things that would set them up to understand that this community that they're learning with um, is going to be critical to their success. Sure. And the opening thing um, that we did actually in the very beginning was when people introduced themselves, we had them repeat, and I'm a teacher and a learner in this mm. community. Because the reality is we're all learning from each other and we're all teaching each other. And that is an intentional statement that all the faculty and staff used. We had each of the students use because they have things to teach us. They have things mm -hmm. to teach each other. And we have things to learn from each one of our interactions and the, the experiences that we bring to this college. Mm, that is so, um, so great. I mean, this, this, I, this uh, piece of kind of this dual identity in this space, right? Mm -hmm. So we're bringing all of this other stuff, but the roles that we play, we might, you know, you might be a faculty person, I might be a student, but there's still, we're still playing a dual role, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so important. And it also speaks to this opportunity for power, right? I think is, is, is another piece of that that I find really fascinating when we talk about students because students often feel that they don't have power right 
Um, and, and it's almost always situational. I do an exercise um, when I'm talking about power and privilege, I usually use rankism as a way to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And rankism, you know, really talks about it's the mother of all isms and there's always someone trying to pull rank and there's somebody's and there's nobody's. And, and whenever I ask students, you know, okay, well, which one are you? And they're like, oh, we're nobodies. Oh, okay. So when you go here, are you a nobody? No, I'm not there. Do pre-vet students think you're nobodies? Oh no, pre-vet students think that we're awesome, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, there's the like, you know, person at the grocery store when you have like your white coat on and you know, you have your your little badge and you're a veterinary student. Do they think that you're a nobody? No, they don't think. But you know, there's but they're so deeply mired in this idea until they're forced to think about they had these other roles. Like, I don't have power. This is where I am. I'm supposed to learn all of this stuff, do all of this stuff versus, hey, I actually have something meaningful to contribute mm -hmm. to this community, to this learning environment, to the profession. Like I'm here because I have something to push out, not just something to suck in, <laughs> right? <laughs> So it really speaks to that power piece. It's just, it's really quite fascinating. So, yeah. And I think one of the ways we're also trying to have them think about it, particularly in professional skills, is when you graduate and you're the doctor, the power relationship with the client and understanding how you um, approach that from a relationship centered mm -hmm. uh, orientation. So yeah. that what you're trying to do is partner. I think so much of it is partnership. Like I may carry this set of experiences or information or whatever it may be, but we can partner because yeah. I've got something to learn from you as well. Right, um, yeah. right, right. So important. So um, I'm assuming that this is gonna be all through the whole program at University of Arizona, yes? Yes, yeah. Awesome. The, the orientation was just the beginning, um, but it was foundational. We also, mm -hmm. um, did a number of other things. We did a blessing ceremony with um, one of our staff members who is a native healer. And we invited a, um, other community members in to do that with us. You know, there's a number of things yeah. where we want to both acknowledge all of the things that we are here at the University of Arizona um, and in this region. And so we did those things. Um, we also um, began to, um, you know, there's we're a new school. So there's yeah, lots yeah. of things we're lots learning in the process. And there's lots of things the students are teaching us about how we can make our process better. So, you know, I'm not painting, painting the Kumbaya picture, but the goal is that if we are engaged in dialogue together, then we get better together. And of course there's different levels of, of responsibility and accountability for us to fix those problems. But there's shared, there is a, a shared process where how the students experience this place, how the faculty, how the staff, how each of us experiences it is important to our growth and development. And so that spirit of teachers, learners, how do we create continuous opportunities for feedback? What are we going to do to make sure that we see ourselves through all the lenses that there are in the experience, whether it's how the community perceives us, how student perceives us, how faculty and staff experience the college, how, how anyone experiences yeah. us. So, so what recommendations um, can you give your colleagues at other uh, veterinary colleges looking to do some of this work and looking to incorporate inter group communication strategies and content into their curriculum? So one of the things I would say is um, it's, so it seems simple and it's complex. <laughs> of course. You know, I was going to say that, Lisa. <laughs> Isn't everything, right? <laughs> That's what I have to say. We have this whole thing in the off, in our office at AAVMC and, and, and it started years ago and it's uh, how hard could that be? Right, it seems so simple. Um, and, and invariably it would be like a six month project that somebody thought we could do in a week, right? And so, right, so right. yes. <laughs> yeah. And so some of the recommendations I have is that there are a lot of resources out there. We also hope 
we're going to put in a presentation, I mean, a proposal for the conference next year to talk about our orientation process, the kinds of things that we did, what our goals were, how we had students create a mission statement for their class that represented mm -hmm. all of them. So I, I think that one of the things is what's the mindset shift needed? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a critical piece that the work we're doing, when I say we're trying to have all of us uncover our assumptions so that we can begin to reconstruct our relationships differently, um, we have to know that that's a process. And it's a process that requires tending to all the time. So we don't just do it in orientation. Right. We have to commit to the process. We will fail in the process and we will pick ourselves up out of the ditch and we will <laughs> get back on the road in the process. And that's part of the process. And so, um, you know, sure, you could take one of the activities and do it. But does it have meaning that gets developed over time? And how does the depth of those relationships continue to be supported? How do we surface conflict in ways that makes it generative um, and create something new? You know, one of the things that we're doing is also encouraging different points of view when students are viewing, say, um, a video of a client encounter with a doctor. You know, and it's set up in a particular way. So we ask people, well, what's the perspective of the client? What's the perspective of the doctor? What are different thoughts? Who, who also has a different perspective on what that perspective is? So the more we can encourage each other to name what we see differently as, a, as an ethos, a fundamental value, yeah. then the more that we're going to be able to do that with students. But it also means that they are going to require us to do the same. Yeah. So, right, right. you know, I think that's the hard part is we have to walk. I hate the phrase walk the talk. It's actually a little ableist. What do I want? Yes. To There's another <laughs> phrase, Lisa, that's not accountability. Talking. You want to hold folks accountable. <laughs> yes. Yes. For what we're asking others to do. We want to do what we're asking others to do. Um, and so I think that some of that is how can you look at opportunities within the curriculum? Because if it's just, and I know, because I worked on a cent in centrally at the University of Arizona, everything I did was an add-on. It was never mm -hmm. core. <laughs> so I have mm -hmm. so much appreciation for working on the margins where what you do just kind of makes a difference for those who come. <laughs> and it's hard work. Yes, versus yes. having the opportunity to build it in. So I think I, I appreciate both of those challenges. But I often think, you know, what, how is it that we one, start to create language for doing this that is common across everyone? How do you help people understand the value of looking at assumptions and cognitive bias, not just around some things, but around all the ways in which cognitive bias shows up, but then gets embedded in power structures. How do you begin to break that down? Um, so I think there are small steps to take, yeah. but honestly, I've spent a year with my colleague who was formerly at UCLA and we've been doing online intergroup dialogues and dialogue oh, wow. trainings. So we did it pre-pandemic. Um, and I know folks question whether you can really do it and you can. Um, but even my colleagues in the intergroup dialogue field are like, you can't do it. And we're like, yes, come and experience it. Um, because you can break down barriers, even on yeah. Zoom, um, if you create the container in which students or any participant has the opportunity to engage in meaningful ways that are both structured and fluid. So I feel like I'm not giving a lot of great advice, no, it's... but I think those are all the things that need to happen. And, and of course, it does start with a leadership commitment, mm -hmm. but there's lots you can do even without permission. Great. That's how I always felt when I was working there on the you go. Margins. Like, oh, yes. I'm gonna go do this well, thing. Well, you, when you're working on the margins, you're used to asking for forgiveness after. <laughs> yep. You're Absolutely. figuring, I'm already marginalized. So, you know, what's <laughs> the return on investment tends to be higher. Right. right? right. <laughs> 
Right. So, um, so for those professionals who are just out in the field and are not really in a situation where they can just say, okay, well, I'm putting my whole clinic through, you know, a, a four-year intergroup <laughs> communication cut, like that's not going to happen. Right. So like, what are the quick and dirty things? <laughs> You know, that they can do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. That's a great question, Lisa, because I think that, um, you know, in looking at organizational culture, one is one question that I always ask if you're in a, in a leadership role in the organization or in some way influencing and have power, right? Which mm -hmm. our professionals will. <laughs> right, right. Even if they're within, um, you know, a larger corporation, you still have power to influence. Right. Is one is what is the organizational culture you want? Like start with your values. What are the values that you want? If open communication is a value, then how do you develop skill to have that open communication? It's not just open communication is really important. And then uh, somebody comes to me and they tell me something and I'm really defensive mm -hmm. and then I leave it, right? <laughs> but right, you know, right, I can right. be defensive and then I can come back around and say, oh, I was really defensive and I'm working through that. And now I, and I really appreciate it. So, so identifying even those kinds of skills around how do we talk to each other? What's important in our relationships? Do you feel comfortable even raising questions or concerns? And there's great um, literature out there around um, high performing medical teams and psychological safety. Yeah. Uh, and so many of the pieces around psychological safety, it's been looked at more in human medicine, but it's applicable to any medical team is that when there is high psychological safety, um, there's a psychologist who has spent 20 years of her career developing and looking at researching it in her dissertation. I can't remember her name right now, but she's written many books on it. But at the core is communication mm. and the the and from the top, encouraging, challenging the person at the top, asking the questions to that person and creating openness to that so that you can take risks. And when mistakes happen, because mistakes happen all the time, yeah. that there's not punishment for the mistake mm -hmm. because high performing medical teams have enough psychological safety, which means they know each other, they yeah. communicate well. I mean, if that's a starting point, even for some of um, you know, our professionals in the field already, that is really powerful. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a book that she's written that's really powerful about psychological safety in medical teams. And she does a debriefing and she looks at all kinds of teams, NASA teams, and how we ended up with the space shuttle disaster. You know, I mean, all of those things. Yeah. Like, and looking at when mistakes are made and they get to disasters, how did we get there? And it's usually because risk, people are risk averse. They don't want to question authority because there's not enough psychological safety to take the risks to make good things happen. Wow. Wow. And so, um, and then even one of the more critical things is that the after action review, like something has happened and you want mm -hmm. the team to review what happened, you actually do it without the leader because the leader oh. often influences, so power influence what influences what gets said in the room. And so always mm -hmm. being aware of those power dynamics as well. So those are some of the things that I would um, have folks think about. Great, and so uh, so I think that the author that you were talking about is Amy Edmondson. Yes, yes, yes. Thank yes, you for yes. looking that up. I was hoping you yes. were looking it up. <laughs> I'm on it. So definitely check out the work of uh, uh, Amy Edmondson. Um, she talks about psychological safety um, being critically important in in medicine and. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a really great write up um, and I will certainly post that um, on the social media channels um, about a talk that she gave at AAMC, um, one of our sister organizations, Association of American Medical Colleges, talking about um, that psychological safety leading to fewer uh, medical errors and better performing teams. So get with also it, folks. What I appreciate about her work, because I came to it after I had been doing intergroup dialogue work, is I was doing it as we were trying to assess centrally at the University of Arizona, how we create an inclusive organization at a broader level. Mm. And so in looking at some of the research that's out there on organizational inclusion behavior, 
then led me to see much more of her work. And that those two things are act psychological safety is actually even more important when you're trying to create inclusive organizations because mm -hmm. people have to feel like they can voice something, be heard, that it matters and makes a difference and that people are willing to engage in that kind of dialogue or conversation. Yeah, so important, so important. Uh, so definitely check out her work. Like I said, I'll be posting some of that information. Um, and it really kind of also dovetails nicely with, um, I mean, follower, followers of the show know I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. And when she talks about bravery and bravery isn't necessarily just this like charge kind of thing, but there's that, that um, you know, this notion of safe spaces, there are rooms for, there are places for safe spaces, but brave spaces is really where we kind of aspire to where there is some, some of that, that psychological safety that allows you that freedom yeah. to be able to give feedback, to be able to question, to be mm -hmm. able to to express that ambivalence, like, I don't, I don't know if this is really the way that we should be right, going, right. but somebody needs to say it before we all go off the cliff, right? Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely um, it, it dovetails nicely with that work. So one last question for yes. you, Teresa. So for any of the additional, just kind of folks out in the field, just random, like what is the one thing that they can do to just be better communicators? ask better questions. So for example, um, a critical skill is to say, tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. It's not a question, but it brings out more from the other person. I'm really interested in what you're saying. Tell me more. Oh, tell me more about what you mean by this. So how is it we can spend less time thinking about what I want to say, how can I spend less time thinking about what I want to say <laughs> and be more <laughs> interested in learning from that other person and, and have a lot of curiosity. Partic and particularly, it's hard. I'm a comp I grew up in a conflicted household as a child. I grew up not wanting conflict. And then I went into work that's all about like, oh, let's get in the room, <laughs> talk about hard things. I'm like, this is my form of therapy is to do it professionally. But often I think about if I'm committed to the relationship of working with someone, for example, who's on my team, um, and I want that to work and for us to be a high functioning team, how can I get closer and listen more carefully to someone I disagree with? Mm. Mm. Because mm. if I can seek first to understand the other person, even when I don't want to, I mean, I have to have the, right. I mean, honestly, right. you gotta, you There's gotta, gotta have, be some desire there. There's gotta, you gotta be have the energy <laughs> one to do it. You have to have the desire because there are times when I don't, or I might right. choose not to, or I'm like, not yes. my job. Somebody else has got to do that right. today. Um, well, I feel like it's my job every day at work, but you know, in other settings, I can be like, right. not my job today uh, is to really think about how do I get curious about why this person is making me upset? <laughs> to learn more about what their story is so I can find common ground and build a relationship enough such that there's an opportunity for them to also learn about me. Mm -hmm. And so am that, I curious? Yeah. Am I curious? That is, that's really great advice. So folks, um, Teresa didn't say that folks um, ask dumb questions, but you you can all ask better questions. I, that's the takeaway. <laughs> and sometimes this is my strategy. Stuff, like somebody will say something, you know, and it's like this little verbal, right? And then everybody goes, oh. So the silence, and then say, oh, tell me more about that. Tell me more. Tell me yeah. more. Yeah. Like that's what I will say when I'm getting triggered and activated by something someone has said and what I want to do is not react initially. I mean, sometimes I want to react and I just react. Right, right, right. Um, but if I'm, how can I, and often when people repeat what they're saying and they're like, oh, this is what I meant to say. Oh, this is the thing. Oh, this is why. It's, it can mm. be really interesting, but I also have to not be attached to the outcome because if I get attached 
to them understanding me, then that just sets me up to be frustrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so commit to, to, to engaging the person, but don't commit to uh, being reliant that they will, air quote, come around, right? right. That, like, that, 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 that don't be so attached to what you think your desired outcome is. Great advice. Because Great when advice. I think about my own learnings, Lisa, around my own areas of privilege, which have mm -hmm. been kind of rough at times. <laughs> Same. They're always sort of like, whoops, Same. bring you up short. Oh, okay. Um, I, if I can think about how hard it was for me to, until the last couple of years, um, really understanding at a deep level uh, my cisgender privilege because of a close relationship um, where a family member came out to me. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it up close. Like I could intellectualize it. I could do oh, all yeah. of that. And then I realized here's all the ways I have done harm over time and never known it for five plus decades. Well, you know, I, I don't know that I count. Right, right, years, right, right. But you know, for, <laughs> since I've been doing right. this work for 30 years. Yeah. So I also have to give myself grace, hold myself accountable and do the same. And do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, such a great conversation. Thank you so much Absolutely. for this conversation on the show today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so if you uh, are listening or watching, please be sure to continue to follow the, the discussion. Like I said, I'll be posting some things on social media um, after the show. This has been another episode of AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on air to my guest, Teresa. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for being on the show. I really, Thanks. really appreciate it. Thank you for discussion. sharing airtime with you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. So be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and be sure to also like us on our Facebook page, which is AAVMC uh, Diversity and Inclusion on Air. And so with that, thanks for listening.